Hey guys, it's Hank here. One of the most hyped topics is heat. Oh my God, heat, 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 heat. And today we're gonna to be breaking it down. Like, does it actually make a difference? What is the actual science behind it? And what can we actually take away? And not just anecdotal stories of people being like, I gained an inch doing, you know, using my heat pad. So to start, we're gonna be looking at the effects of heat on actual tendons because there's not a lot of data looking at actual heat on penile tissue, okay? So why can we use tendons? Well, if you actually look at the type of collagen that actually composes tendons, it's largely type one collagen. If you actually look at the type of collagen that's actually in the penile tissue, it's largely type one collagen, especially when we're talking about the tunica, which we want to expand. So we can extrapolate safely from that. So you guys know I love my rat studies, these poor rats. But in this study, they actually stretched the, the actual tails of rats. So they had actual different actual stretches that they would do, whether it be like moderate or whether it be like vigorous at 37 degrees Celsius, which is essentially body temperature, guys. And a couple of key findings, very interesting, okay? So low force, long duration stretching was very effective at residual elongation, meaning actually like permanently elongating the rat tails, which guys, rat tails are made out of collagen, okay? So they also found that it was very effective if you elevated the temperature and maintained that temperature even prior to stretching it, you still had very good elongation. So this was interesting too lower loads applied at elevated temperatures for prolonged periods of time found to were found to produce significantly greater residual elongation so like all of these things obviously can be directly applied to pe so using heat especially before but using low tension using heat while you're stretching can actually lead to permanent rat tail elongation okay so here's another rat study looking at actually the rat ACLs, okay? The big, you know, anterior cruciate ligament in the knee. What they found is that when, when you're heating from room temperature, okay, up to body temperature, okay? So we're not talking about adding additional heat above body temperature. We're just talking about going from cold to hot or to room temperature, body temperature rather. They found that there was a significant increase in elasticity of those tendons. So you could actually get more stretch out of them. But guys, a lot of this data, you have to understand when we're talking about heat, it's talking about taking something at room temperature, that's like cold and bringing it up to body temperature, not taking something that's body temperature and increasing it above that. So keep that in mind, but let's continue. So this is a very interesting paper that was looking at actual human data on tendons. And what they did is they basically looked at how the tendons and the knees basically stretched by applying either a cold pack, slow heat, or fast heat, and basically how quickly they could basically Basically move those tendons and actually measuring the elasticity. Callie's going to put up some pretty interesting pictures at the, from the study of how they actually measured like the elasticity of the tendon and actually like the force needed to move it. And what they concluded from these studies is that cold increases the force necessary to passively move that range of motion where it actually heat minimizes the force that's needed so you can get actually more stretch with less force by applying heat and cold and heat both alter the ls elasticity of the anterior and posterior cruciate ligaments as well as the tendon and muscle so my takeaway from the study was basically using heat means you can get more stretch with less actual force in tendons so all that is looking pretty promising for heat but guys here is a in my opinion a major drawback and this is a little bit controversial maybe You'll see what I mean by that, but heat actually causes edema, okay guys? So in my personal experience, when I started using heat, I never used to get any kind of like bullfrog neck, if you guys are, if all my pumping guys know what I mean, when I would use my pump. But the second I started using heat, especially if I used it the entire time I was pumping, high heat, I did get significant edema. And guys, this is because there's literally something that's called heat edema, okay? Kelly's gonna put up some screenshots here. But basically, when you have heat, what it causes is vasodilation, meaning the blood vessels, usually like largely in your skin or your other cutaneous structures will actually dilate and they therefore they allow more like fluid to actually like permeate or like penetrate through the tissue leading to additional edema. There's people who literally can just go outside in the summertime and their legs will swell because of just the heat in the summertime. If you are doing PE and using heat, you are at a much greater risk of having a significant more edema formation. And why that matters is because guys, as I talked 
about before, like there's this term that is like expansion. It's like, oh yeah, measuring expansion. I think you have your like edema in this circle and then you have your expansion in this circle. And then there's this like huge area where they overlap and like these small areas like on the fringe where you can really know which is which. A lot of people are like, oh, I started using a heat pack and I got much faster expansion. Could it actually be expansion because your collagen is actually like looser? Yeah, it could be. Could it actually be you think it's expansion, but you're actually just accumulating edema much faster? Yeah, yeah, it could be. It's one of those things where I think it's kind of hard to tell. I mean, with enough time, edema will be very clear versus like expansion will be very clear. But it's just something that I think is a little bit of a misnomer when people are like, oh yeah, heat equals more expansion. It's like, mm, e easy there. So now we're gonna talk about like the effects of heat on vascular structures because the penile is a very vascular tissue, guys. This is a very good article here that summarized basically all of these studies that are looking at all of these different types of heat therapy and its effects on your vascular structure. Now this is largely from like a cardiovascular health, like a blood vessel and blood pressure health study, but I'm gonna point out some of the highlights here. So I'm probably gonna butcher this name, but there's something that's called Wa'on therapy, Wa'on therapy. Sorry for all of my like Asian American dudes assuming this, yeah, it's, this is a Japanese therapy. But basically what they found is that when you were in a 15 minutes in a far infrared sauna sent, set to 60 degrees Celsius with the goal of increasing your core temperature by one to 1 1.5 degrees Celsius led to an up regulation of endothelial nitric oxide synthase and protein content in endothelial cells. So by Using this technique, you had better endothelial cells, okay? For those that don't know, guys, your endothelial cells lines your blood vessels there, what's essentially responsible for erections, okay? Max making sure that you have good nitric oxide and good endothelial cell function is crucial, guys. You know I want to point to vigor, but I'm going to talk about that later. So there's something that's called the Onsen Hot Springs, or Bathing Hot Springs, which basically showed using these hot springs in improved circulation in rats and improved blood pressure regulation. Here's one on Finnish sauna bathing, where men were sitting in a room between between 80 to 100 degrees Celsius, uh, anywhere between five to 20 minutes. The key with this is that they would like be in the sauna and then go to a cold environment and then go back in the sauna. So it was going like back and forth. What they found was that there was a transient decrease in arterial stiffness that they found. So you had basically a more, more stretchable, more elastic uh, like blood vessels, which is very important for overall, especially when talking about arterial heart, especially in your arteries. One of the main takeaways that I also saw was that they looked at like long-term heat exposure. So over an eight week span of 30 minute sessions, three times per week, whether you immersed your body in either hot water or a sauna, they found that this essentially improved your function, your your blood vessel function almost as much as a moderate intensity cycle training. They basically concluded that this is actually a reasonable alternative to exercise in people, in like elderly people that can't actually exercise. So that's pretty interesting. So there is some benefit as far as vascular tissue, why maybe we should be using heat. The endothelial function, the arterial stiffness, and even the overall like blood vessel dilation and blood flow. So next we gotta talk about wound healing because there's a lot of actually conflicting data in my opinion about does heat help with wound feeling, healing or hurt with wound healing. So this paper actually looked at mice with wound healing evaluated with temperatures between either 23 degrees Celsius or 73 degrees Fahrenheit up to 43 degrees Celsius or 109 degrees Fahrenheit. And what they found is that wound healing was actually delayed in the 49 degree Celsius group, meaning the higher temperature exposure, it actually hindered the wound healing. Once again, guys, details matter. I know I might sound pretentious about this, but you really need to know like, like what type of collagen is being affected. Here you can see that the collagen in the actual corpus cavernosum is primarily one, three, and four, okay? With the endothelial cells largely secreting collagen type four. But the main thing that's made up is in the penis is largely type one with less type three. What they found in this study is that when they exposed the higher temperatures, the 43 degrees Celsius group, you actually had an increased expression of the type three collagen and a decreased expression of the type one. Part of the reason for that is actually the type three gets essentially converted into type one collagen, but at the initial, you have a decrease of collagen type one, which in my opinion, my interpretation of this data is actually not a good thing. So I've mentioned this before, but there's also something that's called the MMP or matrix metalloproteinase. It's responsible for essentially breaking down collagen. Collagen. So why does this matter? Because when you actually exposed that body to higher temperatures, 
they found that it actually increased the matrix metalloproteinase one expression and reduced the MMP2. So is this potentially a good thing? Maybe. So if we're talking about we want to break down actual collagen bonds and allow it to expand, then we actually would in theory want more so MMP matrix metalloproteinase, okay? I am going to be making a full video dedicated just to MMP, just to kind of really refine that largely for my own knowledge. But I think that is a very important here. So we do upregulate MMP, could be a good thing. So I have a whole video on like collagen and the collagen stretch signal. You guys should watch that after this one to learn more about the impact of collagen and that stretch signal and what it actually does to promote more collagen growth. I also have a video about elastin, okay? I think it's a very underrated component of PE that doesn't really get talked about. And in this study, they found that it is a negative effect on the elastic component because actually the protein that actually breaks down elastin is actually increased with the expression of higher heat. So conclusions from the study is that heat, at least 49 degrees Celsius, is bad for wound healing, it's bad for collagen type 1, it's bad for elastin, but it is good for that MMP. Okay. So largely, I think this is a more of a, like, maybe heat isn't as much of a good thing study. However, guys, once again, there's conflicting evidence. Here's a study that actually looks at the use of heat and wound healing, and it says that heat is actually a good thing. What they did is they looked at basically skin grafts from donors. So they basically cut off a, a donor site of the skin, and they exposed it to different temperatures. One was exposed to 38 degrees Celsius with incremental series. So heat on, heat off, heat on, heat off, and one had no radiant heat whatsoever. However, they found that the actual healing was improved in the skin graft exposed to heat. So conflicting evidence, take from it what you want. So something that has come up largely between like PERV and PD is the effects on the actual nervous system, specifically the sympathetic nervous system or the fight or flight puts you tense, puts you at edge, releases adrenaline, okay? That can be a bad thing for PE because especially when we're talking about like erections or like relaxing for blood flow to the penis, that's a parasympathetic point, meaning erection, P, parasympathetic, and then shoot, meaning sympathetic actually for ejaculation, okay? It's a little med school trick. So what they found is that actually when your body is exposed to heat it actually triggers a sympathetic response now this is in the setting of like a sauna or when your whole body is exposed to temperature they don't have any specific studies looking at what happens when you put a heat wrap on your pee pee you have to at least somewhat extrapolate that if this sympathetic response is triggered from the actual skin sensors and you're obviously there's skin sensors on your penile tissue exposing that area to heat would that somehow trigger a more sympathetic response maybe it's something to keep in mind but once again doing pe in a sauna is very different than doing PE using a heat rack. So here's another good thing here. When you're talking about your lymphatic system, you have your lymph nodes, they, they're everywhere in your body, but just look up lymphangiosclerosis or a lymphocele. But basically your lymphatic channels that run along your penis can actually get blocked when you do PE. It's called a lymphocele. Heat actually can cause the lymphatic channels to relax and that could in theory help to reduce your risk of lymphocele or resolve lymphocele or lymphangiosclerosis. If you're suffering from either of those conditions, you should consider using a heat pack, wrap a heat pack around it, low enough temperature where it's not hurting, and then some gentle massage, and I bet you that would actually resolve things a little bit quicker. So here's a very interesting hack, I think, is that when you're using heat, you need to supplement with a nitric oxide booster. Well, why is that, Hink? Well, guys, in this study right here, they show that the nitric oxide has a dual effect on collagen synthesis by fibroblasts, excuse me, and this is due to basically a direct stimulation of collagen synthesis, as well as an increase in one of the heat shock proteins that's responsible for actually further stimulating the fibroblast, which actually stimulate collagen production. So what does this mean? If you use heat and you want to maximize your effects on collagen and helping to build new collagen, it's part of the reason why people use like different heat techniques for actually skin health, you can actually boost your effectiveness by using a nitric oxide booster. Of course, guys, I told you it was coming. Vigor, okay? So this is, in my opinion, the premier nitric oxide boosting supplement on the market, especially for our purposes. It's also great for workouts, guys. It's available on Amazon. It's an Amazon choice. Dude, we're, the thing is like selling through the roof. You should consider something like Vigor or a similar product if you're going to be using heat to maximize your results. So here, guys, I'm not I'm not going to try to talk like fancy terms. But there's something that's called heat shock proteins. They're in your skin, and basically they are activated in response to heat to, to do these different functions within your body. So primarily for our purposes, we're looking at heat shock proteins that are associated with collagen or collagen synthesis. In this study here, they actually actually look at temperature ranges 
between 45 degrees Celsius or 113 degrees Fahrenheit or 60 degrees Celsius or 140 degrees Fahrenheit. Now keep in mind that your average sauna is between like 150 to 175 degrees Fahrenheit and your average shower is about 100 degrees Fahrenheit or, thir or 38 degrees Celsius, okay? But what they had was they took skin and they exposed these different temperatures for eight and 10 seconds at a time, okay? And they looked at the heat shock protein expression. One of the important things in this study, guys, is they talk about how the skin is a reasonable thing to look at when we're talking about penile tissue because it has complex supportive proteins such as collagen, elastin, proteoglycans, which are all synthesized by the dermal fibroblasts, okay? Basically just means very similar tissue to what we're actually caring about. And what they found, like in this graph here, looking at heat shock protein 47, is that using the higher heat actually stimulates more of that heat shock protein that we want, which actually up regulates collagen type 1 synthesis which is a good thing however the heat shock protein 27 is actually a bad thing and simulates and signifies damage and what you can see in this histogram here basically this picture at the bottom is that where those little black arrows are kind of subtle or pointing to is actually expression of the heat shock protein 27. As you can probably guess, it is in fact the highest with that higher temperature. So you get more collagen type 1 synthesis activated, but you also have more damage that occurs. One of the biggest flaws with using skin collagen in general for, for our purposes is that when you're looking at actually the depth of the skin, and its response, it's very superficial. What we care about is actually really penetrating through the skin, through the tunica, and actually into the actual sinusoids of the penis that are actually creating the collagen that goes along the tunica. So you can't just assume because this happens in the skin, if we use the same temperature and apply it to our pee -pees, it's gonna have the same exact effect in the penile tissue. So stay with me guys, we're almost at the conclusion, I promise, okay? A very important thing is actually how the collagen fibers are aligned. If you guys remember my anti-locks video, I actually talked about how basically what the anti-locks did was rearrange the collagen fibers and allow them to expand. So why does this matter, guys? So actually guys, heat can actually rearrange the alignment of the collagen fibers which could allow them to expand more because the actual strength and the stiffness is based on the collagen alignment. So using heat could allow certain alignments to relax and actually allow for more expansion. And guys, if you're not aware, my course is live. I break down penile enlargement in the simplest terms that in a very quick, efficient manner. And really, we're talking about 30 minutes a day. And in my case, I was able to put on an inch and a half in about three years, okay? So you could certainly do the same. I have verified results. If you're interested, the link is in the description. All right, guys, so what are the different types of heating? So this is gonna be quicker. Obviously, if you're using a water pump, you could use something like hot water in the pump. You need to be careful because number one, you're gonna lose heat quickly with that without a basically an external source, but you also don't want to use too hot of water. You can use an actual heat pad. So guys, this is actually one of the heat pads that we're testing for peak male physique. If you're interested, we're probably going to have those available, but make sure you get to the conclusion of the study before you just go trying to buy a heat pad. Interestingly enough, one of the studies actually mentioned why they did not use heat pads because they said, although inexpensive, it is not ideal because the uneven heat owing to difficulty wrapping fabric around irregular shaped body parts, as well as the fixed and subjective heat settings such as low, medium, and high. Just how you guys have a reference, at least when you're talking about like a sunbeam heat pad, the max temperature that they actually take it to is about 140 degrees, which is some of the higher temperatures used in some of the studies that we talked about. So what about IR? Oh my God, IR, IR, IR. And you know, there's, I, I, I get it to an extent. The difference between like IR and just typically like radiant heat. So the IR actually travels basically through the air, doesn't deposit its energy in the air and does it, and it waits until it comes in contact with an object to actually deliver the heat. So you get a more basically direct heat transfer. You don't lose actually any energy in the air or other types of like radiant heat, like obviously a space heater or a blow dryer. You're actually heating the air and then using that air around it to actually heat the tissue. So it's kind of a less, less direct method. So I actually hit up my boy Perv for this because that dude is brilliant and pretty hilarious by the way. Well, let me just read you what he said. IR just simply isn't necessary for something the size of a penis. Literally no matter how big your penis is, it's not the size of an effing hamstring or forearm. Keep in mind that this is from the same person that manufactures and sells IR heating pads, massivenovelties.com. There you go, Perv, um, if you're interested. But for PE purposes, when talking about heating the tissues, IR is overkill. The only potential caveat is there is mixed data, guys, that there could be potential a healing benefit. 
that the jury is out. Some studies say yes, some studies say no. So long story short, you don't need IR. I agree fully. I, I definitely don't think you need IR to actually get the benefits of heat. So I also hit up my boy BD. If you guys haven't seen his channel, check it out to get his thoughts on heat. And here he is right here. Is it absolutely necessary? No. For most of my penis enlargement career, I have not used heat and I gained well over two inches. It definitely helps, but I don't think it's an absolute necessity. All right, guys. So I know this was a long video. I thought it was very interesting. I learned a lot, but here are my conclusions. Okay. Number one, avoid cold. Cold is the enemy. Okay. Heat isn't as important is as important as avoiding cold. The cold will cause you to have to increase the actual force needed to get the stretch results you want. Once again, we're talking about going from something room temperature to body temperature, not necessarily needing to go above that. I do think heat is important for warming up though. So, you know, here's a hot take for you. Not my angry hot take, just a hot take. But I think one of the most effective uses of heat in PE would actually be to literally just like wrap your D in a warm wrap before you do any kind of PE to allow those tissues to restretch and relax and help make them more malleable. That to me is the most efficient use of heat. I do think if you're using something like a low tension extender, especially something for a longer period of time, or you know, even hanging for example, you could potentially expedite your gains using a heat wrap with that with some of those low tension exercises based on that rat tail study that we looked at. You need to use a nitric oxide booster if you're going to use heat to maximize your outcomes. I do think there's an increased risk of edema and sometimes that like edema versus expansion argument. I, I don't think your average person can tell the difference between edema and expansion personally. Hot take again. Final answer. I'm on the hot seat. Do I think heat is effective? Yes, I do. Okay. Do I think it's a game changer? No, I don't. Am I going to try to use heat? In my opinion, the hack that I think kind of makes sense is certainly I'm going to use heat to warm up. I am also going to try to use heat for the first half of my pumping sets. And the reason for that is I can use that heat to help relax that tissue, help to kind of relax that collagen, relax those bonds, potentially allow more stretch. But then once I get it in that stretch position, there's this theory of if you cool it down, is it going to, is the collagen going to kind of fix in place? I don't know how much I believe that, but I do think it kind of makes sense. Basically, I'm using heat for the first half of my workouts, okay? That's just my takeaway, guys. You do your own research, figure out what works for you. And finally, guys, if you're having lymphatic issues, then you can use heat to potentially help resolve those a little bit faster. This is a long video. I love you guys. Remember, there's nothing wrong with self-improvement, but you are enough just as you are. Thanks for watching, guys. Peace and love.